Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Brockwell Park Community Greenhouses uh, Gardener's Question Time for Saturday, the 30th of May. Um, hopefully I've got uh, quite a packed uh, show content wise for this afternoon. So we are going to dive right in. Um, and so I'm just gonna welcome uh, today's guest. Uh, Fabrice is community gardener at Myatsfield Park. Uh, Myatsfield Park is a, is a 14 acre uh, Victorian park in the kind of Camberwell, Stockwell area. It's a, a very short walk due west of Camberwell Green. Um, I really suggest that you take a visit um, as soon as you feel safe and able to do so. Um, and I'm just gonna pass uh, straight over to Fabrice who is just gonna tell us a little bit about his horticultural career. And then I've got a, a bunch of questions and I'm sure the rest of the panel will do too to ask him after that. So welcome Fabrice, thank you very much. And uh, over to you to start us off. All right, hi Fabrice. So, hi, this is Fabrice. Yeah, so, Basically, I started doing horticultural stuff at Brockwell Park Community Greenhouses in 2006 and I was involved for the next sort of six or seven years there in the run up to the greenhouses getting more organised and getting funding. And then after that I moved on to my first property paid job which was at Mount Hills Park where I've been since about 2013. And yeah, I've been doing a community garden, been a community garden there, doing a range of different things. It's from year to year, it's dependent on the funding, but the site is much smaller than Brockwell Park Community Greenhouses. It's got a big greenhouse, a bit like at, my, at uh, Brockwell Park, but a slightly different layout, and it's only got one and a small outdoor space. So it's quite a different project with a bit of a much different emphasis. And one of the main emphases there is because we're a small park, not very much space is we've always done things into the local community. So it's always been about supporting people off-site doing things. Well, that's always been a large part, if not most, of my job. And we've carried on with that. And with COVID, that's only uh, intensified that because we can't really do very much in the park. The other thing we've also started doing is in the last year or so, we've hired, or the, the organisation hired Tony Danford, who's a very experienced horticulturalist, who is now looking at developing programs into the park. Unfortunately, that's been discovered by COVID. So for the time being, we're producing vegetable seedlings for local people. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if you could tell me. How we got into that and how we do it. Yes, please. So we've been now, we, for the last four years, we've been supplying alter, uh, initially all of Lambeth and then more recently just the local area, like the local ward, Basel and Cold Harbour, to any community group who wanted vegetable seedlings in season to for their community growing project. So it's always, it has never been individuals. It's always been if you've got a few individuals on the street or a community garden or a charity, it doesn't matter how they're constituted or if they're constituted at all. It's just, are you doing it with more than one person effectively? Um, we give them veggies. And what we do is we give them, a, initially it was like bespoke, but that was a nightmare. It was, well, it was fine for them, which is a lot of work for me is we give them a choice of veggie seedlings for the, you know, it's grown, grown on, often four weeks old, for some plants six weeks old, some plants up to 10 weeks old. We'll give them a pack, for either five square meters or 10 square meters, they can have as many packs as they want. And uh, we'll give, that, give it to them right at the start of the growing season. And then, uh, so that'll be beginning of April. And then again, uh, May, so they can get a warm weather crop, so like the, the courgettes and the beet and the tomatoes and things. And yeah, they can just have those. And the idea behind that was to support like the community organisers on estates or on a street or on a community project who often would, would who often stretch to do everything because they're doing all the other things on the estate too. But you know, they may be able to organise a few planting days. So if you can get them the plants rather than trying to buy it and start everything from seed, they end up having a lot more success. So that's essentially what we do. That's the core service, at least as, I, as, I, as I'm providing for the wider community at the moment. However, with COVID, we've sort of changed things around. So we're now focusing everything on getting seedlings for people. And we're doing, we've done, we're doing about three separate things. So the first thing we did was just a general plant giveaway. That was done through the website. But because it was done through the website, it targeted essentially a better off audience, which is not what we're funded to do. So that's fine, they got the plants and we're happy they got them, but we've also got to reach lots of other people because that's what our funding's conditional on. So we are now basically trying to get seedlings out to anybody who's 
growing with other people in any kind of shape or form, so long as it's kind of safe to do so because of COVID. So we're giving, getting plants ready for big giveaways on estates. We've already done some. Uh, we are trying to get something set up called Backyard Farms, which we call it a backyard farm for the shit hell of it. But it's basically, if anybody's got a bigger patch of ground, we're trying to get see if they want to convert some of it to vegetable growing, particularly if they want to help out their neighbours or they're, or they're on their super low income and they've got issues with food poverty and feeding themselves, of which there is a lot of that going on in Basel and Columbus, the bigger states and a huge amount of poverty and lots of people are eating badly or increasingly not eating enough. That was already a problem, but COVID's only made it worse. So there's stuff happening around that. Uh, and then the other thing that we're doing, what else are we doing? That's basically it. We're just trying to get as many plants as possible to as many people as possible. And we're trying to target it a bit more. Um, yeah, any community garden we're still in touch with, sure, we're still trying to get them plants too. Uh, there's also a bit of growing on the, on the site. Cause there's some the, the, the old converted cold frames, a bit like at Brockwell Park. And then we just got a volunteer growing at the moment, loads of salad leaves, it's going to get turned over to tomatoes and beans quite shortly. And that's going to essentially a, a food, a, just basically a mini food basket to our existing volunteers at the moment, who are currently not coming in. So that's sort of what we're doing, we're just basically churning out seedlings. And we'll be churning out seedlings at the highest rate we can, probably until the end of August, early September. So we're going to, at the moment, we're trying to get this. The warm weather crops all finished off and out the next two weeks, hopefully, and then we're going to switch to cool weather crops. So the stuff that will kind of crop in late summer into the autumn and maybe into the winter. And the other thing we're doing is we're targeting crops that are easy for beginners to start to do or are high yielding. And so it's lots of cut and, get, cut and come again stuff and fruiting crops. So we're not trying to get everybody to grow cauliflowers or cabbages, which are harder. It's just chard, kale, beans, pumpkins, courgettes, tomatoes, chilies. Um, and things like that so it's nice and simple so i guess my first question for you fabrice is and we will we will revisit this before the show ends but if you're watching this back on youtube and you're thinking this sounds excellent for me i have a little bit of space or i know someone that has a bit of space that would be interested in this what's the best way to get in touch with you guys to kind of to benefit from this distribution scheme Can they right. just, now, can they this is i suppose if you're friends of Bockwell park community greenhouses you probably get a special from me but technically, we're only funded to do Vassal and Cold Harbour Ward. So if right. you're in Vassal and Cold Harbour Ward, get in touch via our website, or if, if they're happy to get through to Joshua or the, somebody at Brockwell Park Community Greenhouses, well, you've got my email, so you just put them straight through to me. Yeah, okay, no problem. Uh, if anybody's got a greenhouse or a bit of warm space, we've got some special chilies. I've got more than I need. It was something we are going to do with cattle growth, which got cancelled. So if anybody's got a space to grow warm plants, or even if Brockwell Park wants a few special plants, uh, I've got some unusual chilies which just desperate need to find a home. So if you want like 10, 10 chilies all different, give me a shout. Because uh, I'm just happy to I'm just happy to shift those because most people don't have the space to grow them because they're, they're funny South American chilies which need a bit which are long season chilies, so they won't do well outside. So there's bits and bobs always kicking around. Okay. Cold Harbour Wall, I think, stretches almost stretches right up to St. Matthew's estate. That's not very far from Brockwell Park. So if you think about Cold Harbour Lane, yeah, it's full of all stretches right up to that. Or well, we're missing no, not Cold Harbour Lane, sorry, Brixton Water Lane. So that's yeah, so really I've got tons of people uh, who are you know who are in that in those wards and you know maybe don't even realise it. I certainly am not super familiar with the boundaries of. The yeah. But it does get quite close to the park. So if anybody's in, like you've got you've got contacts on St Matthew's Estate, I think you used to in the park or whatever. Just just the estate, just abutting the park, pretty much abutting the park. It's not it's not Tulse Hill. I know that. Uh, that's that's separate. But sort of due north of the park, you know, you're you're essentially in our catchment. It's just because you're further away from us. Yes, sure. There's less traffic, so people don't know about us as much. But if anybody's in that part of the world, uh, it's my job to serve them. So that's cool. I mean, you know, do that without blinking. Everybody else, it's uh, the only other problem is I think I've got post viral fatigue with COVID. So I was uh, planning to be there like 60 hours a week at this time of year because we, we just want to get out as much as possible. That's not happening at the moment. So we're trying to get as much done as possible. So we are actually doing less than we were hoping. So I'm a bit, I'm a, I'm a bit of pressure with it. Uh, but anybody can give me a call and just ask me what they want, what should be planted now and things if you come through from Bogwell Park because I'm stuck at home so I'm quite happy to field questions about what to do with your own vegetable plot 
So again, if anybody, any of the broker, any any of the volunteers at community greenhouses want to give me a call, I'm happy with that. The other thing you could do is maybe set up a mini scheme at your end if you've got any spare seeds and things, just to get some things in modules ready so that people can pick plants up in three or four weeks. I don't know if that works with what you're doing, but that might be a thought. So, you know, if in three or four weeks people pick up things like beetroot plugs or lettuce plugs or chard plugs or the last cucumbers and courgettes. That I mean, that's, that's very much in line with kind of what we do anyway. And I think as we're, that all right, yeah. we're hoping to get back to, you know, a, 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 you know, a place where we can open again to the general public um, with obviously the appropriate social distancing measures in place, there will be plenty of stuff for people to pick up and take home and plant out. Yeah. Um, great. So I, I was just hoping, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone is thoroughly sick of this subject right now, but I was, I wanted to ask you Fabrice kind of what you anticipated this kind of the growing situation with COVID to kind of be like, as we sort of move forward. I mean, do you have a plan? Are you going to, for example, are you going to maintain this seedling distribution scheme? kind of in a post-COVID world, wherever that, you know, well, we're, going to, to. we're going to see what happens. I mean, the idea was we were going to do some, we were always going to do some support. We're going to, we, the plan was this year to support 20 groups locally with seedlings anyway. That's not a big ask. That's quite easy uh, because we're used to doing it and it's not actually very difficult to do. Uh, if you've got some volunteers in the greenhouse, you can just whip through stuff really, really fast and actually produce lots and lots of plants very, very quickly. And so it's just, it's just the organization just to make sure it gets the right people and you've got the right mix of seedlings. So that's easy to do. We're planning to carry on with that. However, because, we're, because of the way we're doing this this year, I think we're developing much better links with a much... What's happened is lots of people who've never done growing before are getting interested in growing. And that's right across the community. It's all incomes. Uh, with people on lower incomes, it's starting to be... I mean, I spoke to from, from Angel Town, like one of the biggest states, and people are just kind of worried and things are getting more expensive so there is a certain element of survival for some people in this um but for other people it's just yeah so lots of people are interested so it'd be pity to let all of that network go to waste so i think it will it'll probably influence what we do in next year if there's lots more people who want stuff we'll rejig what we do we'd already had the idea of doing the backyard farms thing but that was more just as a way of getting you know that was like, you know, with less, with less, there was less uh, kind of social urgency to it. Yes. But if it's successful, and uh, there was still some, there's still plenty where we live, but if it's successful, yeah, we'll try. I, I can't imagine we would we, we try and scale back. We just sort of try and run extra things on the side. The only other thing, this was my little plug, was um, which has got me worried and kind of got us pushing for this more was that. The UK imports half its fruit and veg, so about half its veg and almost all its fruit. Um, and um, there's so actually, you know, I think it's even worse than that. Maybe it's fruit and veg combined, it's like a quarter, and but half its veg is growing, half the veg is growing in the UK. Uh, the government still seems to be carrying on with, wants, still seems to want to push for a hard Brexit over and above COVID. Uh, and because of COVID, not only is vegetable production in the UK being disrupted, but it's being disrupted right across Europe in places where we depend on stuff to come. So, for example, vegetable growing in southern Spain and Italy, where a lot of our veg comes from, and right across the year, is dependent on migrant labour, which is having a tr hard time moving. So, I can't, I mean, I'm not saying it's, in, it's I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not. It's, I can envision there being disruption of some kind. And that, if nothing else, is going to put, you know, it's going to cause prices to shift. And then if prices to shift, then it's only better off people, you know, it's basically rationing via spending power yeah. with poorer people getting cut out. So, uh, yeah, we're just trying to get as much growing locally as possible is basically the worry, is the thing. And also, we've had a, now a very dry spring. At some point, that's going to start impacting on the UK crop. And there's climate change. So if there's an exceptional season elsewhere in one of the markets, in some of the markets supply us, these things could get impacted. So yeah, I just think it behooves everybody who's got any kind of open space just to plonk something on it now if you can. Yeah, it certainly yeah. seems it certainly right. seems prudent if you have the if you have the space to turn it into. And obviously people have a little bit more free time on their hands to be able to to carry out that labour. Do you I mean, is it is it plausible that a uh, you know a significant shift in the way local people grow is? I mean, is that even plausible? But like, 
I just, I, can you envision a, you know, a, a significant shift towards local growing? I don't know. It will help some people. I don't, I mean, we've recently, I mean, we're giving stuff out. Even in like in a really, really dense area of London, like where we live, everywhere. So again, I'd say maybe one. I'm afraid, Fabrice, that your microphone is uh, is breaking up just a little bit. Your audio is cutting out, uh, certainly for me. Um, so what what we're going to do in that case is we are we're going we are absolutely going to come back to this uh, come back to this topic and I'm sure the uh, the members of the panel that were here will have some questions that they would like to ask you uh, as well. Um, but I think in terms of discuss uh, you know a discussion on a on a shift towards uh, more kind of grass literal grassroots growing, I think this is a good time actually uh, to move on to our next piece of content, which is a, a short film that I'd like to show everyone. Uh, it's about so 15, 20 minutes long. So it's, you know, it's a significant piece of content. So I you know, suggest you charge your glasses, get your cup of tea, stick yourself on mute and just sort of sit back and enjoy it. Um, it's, uh, those of you who are familiar with BPCG and the, the regular uh, staff there will know Helen. Um, Helen has been speaking to uh, her partner, Tommy, and interviewing him about uh, a market garden initiative that they have started in Norfolk. Um, this I will upload the uh, the interview. I've you know, I'm trying to edit it a little bit just to get a bit of a uh, better sound quality for it. Um, the back and forth of two different people speaking. Um, I will put the interview up on YouTube uh, after the show. But for now, I've got the interview and a kind of walk around of the entire premises that Helen has done for us. Um, so I'm just going to pop everybody on mute. It's yeah, as I say, it's a it's a significant piece of content. It's about 15, 20 minutes. So. Right, let's just make sure my screen sharing. Um, if for any reason this plays and the sound does not play along with it, would someone mind unmuting themselves and just letting me know so I'm not sat here uh, listening to the sound and you know and really enjoying it while you guys are all uh, drowning in deathly silence. So off we go. Right, so I've just got a message um, in chat uh, asking about the sound. Um, bear with me just a moment. Would someone just mind jumping in and just telling me if we're hearing that or is it still playing in silence? No answer was the loud reply. Um, we can't hear it right now, Josh. But was it playing? Was it playing before, or was it silent? It was silent. But it could have been meant to be silent. Um, right. Okay. No. There's, so Helen is actually doing a voiceover. So yeah, bear with me just a moment, and I will. Walk around so you don't lose your tomatoes. Been no. fleeing through this cold okay. snap. Better. Which if you want to look at Um, 
But Josh, I think we might have gone silent again. Put it again, and then. Oh. And it's back. Right, okay, I'm just going to leave it and mess with it. It's covered with um, here, here. Cecilia as a green manure, and then that's been cut down. You can see all the stems left. Um, and covered with black plastic. Um, and then they've put in a little bit of um, rotted horse manure to create these beds. Tomatoes. This is a bit of outdoor space. Some uh, storm as well, some potatoes. Um, here they've got a bit of frost damage, you can see, but we're hoping they're going to be okay. This is um, more covered grass that we're going to make into beds. Hopefully you have a leg interested in making a dye garden. Um, so these are, this is all new outdoor space. There's lots of brassicas under there um, interplanted with, um, there's all sorts going on. There is, I think these are cauliflowers um, with Oh, cauliflowers might be the other end. No, cauliflowers, onions, you can see in between. Um, and I think there's some kohlrabi as well, just to make the most of the space and also have as much diversity as possible in the soil. And these are lots of different colours of beetroot. And this is chard. And um, Tom has just sown some... Um, What's in there? I think spinach and rocket, things that were struggling in the heat of the polytunnel. So that's why we've made these new outdoor beds. Um, and I've just planted some fennel at the end here. We've been using these string rope markers and a um, very clever um, measuring rake to get these nice straight rows that you can set to different um, centimetre spacing so that you can make the most out of small spaces. It's a lovely bumblebee, there's lots of wildlife here. And um, because we're surrounded by all these trees, there are um, two barn owls that we get to see, which is pretty amazing. Um, we'll quickly show you in one of the polytunnels and then we'll see if Tommy's ready for a quick chat. I don't want to bore you with too much walking around. <laughs> I've been trying to plant some nasturtiums to get that greenhouse feel. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is um, polytunnel. Lots of things that have just been um, cut down and we're going to, that had gone to seed and we're letting them just rot down. It's carrots. Um, it's looking a bit patchy in here, but I'm trying to work on that. It's all a bit of a... Um, well, we're learning how to sort the soil out, basically, as we've moved in and get it as good as possible. I'll just walk you through to the next tunnel. Spring cabbages, nice kale over there, lovely salad. And this is really delicious, tat soy, that's um, a sort of really good stir fry veg, that was lovely. And this is the first tunnel they started growing in, Dodman. Um, with the new drip tape, looking good. So you can see potatoes just flowering, they're looking great. Um, and lots of salad vegetables. These are just gone in courgettes this morning. Um, yeah, lovely. So I'm going to finish the tour. Of that. Oh no, I'll just show you this other polytunnel very quick. So it's all getting cleaned up. These tunnels are um, sort of used by someone else. That structure is, um, I forgot, oh, an oost for drying hops. Because there's a brewery that grow all their own hops. Um, lovely, yeah. So broad beans looking amazing. They've done really, really well. Peas and these cabbages. We're going to let these go to seed to save their seed because they were lovely. This is kohlrabi. Um, lots of chard, beetroot, things like that. There we go. Oh, and at the end, you can see there's another little field area outside with um, brassicas covered in lots of mesh to um, try and save them from the cabbage white. 
Okay, so that's the end of the tour. Go and find Tommy. Hello, Tommy. Hello. <laughs> Do you want to tell us what you're doing right now, first of all? I am just trimming the side shoots off these tomatoes. Um, these side shoots to encourage a bit of upwards growth and to train them to our strings. Um, cool. They were planted in February with a bit of heat in a propagator and they came outside or well, they've been in our polytunnel next door and they've been planted outside two weeks ago cool two weeks today they're um, looking great and they're growing growing up quickly so we just trim off the side shoots here as you well know and then wrap the string around Keep doing that every so often as they go on that, developing these flowering trusses. Okay, nice. Them. Lovely. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a few questions, if that's all right. Um, so we've had a tour of the market garden, yes. and I suppose our first question might be, why, why you wanted to set up a market garden? Um, I wanted to set up a market garden. I got interested in gardening um, quite a few years ago. Um, more just out of an interest of, of, of pottering in the back garden, and which developed into a kind of an interest in plants and horticulture in general. Um, and through that kind of became more interested in the wider spectrum of food growing and the kind of social benefits that it can bring social health benefits that it can bring, mm -hmm. really. Um, started a gardening job in a care home uh, and they had a polytunnel which had been kind of abandoned in the garden and got quite into um, taking residents to the polytunnel and doing little gardening projects and things like that and it kind of kind of blossomed from there really. Cool, um, and then you moved to Bristol? Moved to Bristol where there's a lot of um, a lot of energy for the sort of small farming movement, small scale mm -hmm. growing movement and there's some great projects there, Feed Bristol which is um, like a large community project on um, Avon Wildlife Trust land mm -hmm. um, and they have all sorts of groups visiting, do an awful lot of permaculture and um, mm -hmm. kind of uh, more of like social engagement side of things. Yeah and they have a cool project that's a bit like Better Fridays don't they I think? They do. Um, and then you helped set up Purple Patch Farm with Mary. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so that was a small, small farm on about an acre, sort of within the city mm -hmm. limits. Um, positioned really well to uh, sell to the local community in in a city. Yeah, it's quite interesting plot of land that was set aside for ex-servicemen after the Second World War mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of plots around there. There were sort of five one-acre plots um, where essentially market gardeners would grow and take their um, and, and have a direct route into the city to sell their food. Great. So that, I suppose that's one of the reasons that you were, you're, well one of the interests in setting up a market garden is that we've talked about before that is um, in Norfolk, well in lots of places um, there's a great deal, well, it's like a huge amount of number of these vast farms, um, but there's also like very little locally, local, well, locally produced food available to people who live here, would you say? Yeah, that's, that's it, a sort of... Um, a lot of wheat grown and a lot of animal food crops grown rather than food for people. Yeah, it's a bit of a paradox to be neighboured by farms of sort of 2,500 hectares and upwards. Um, very little of the produce grown on those farms are for the local market, they'll be for the international mm -hmm. market grains that are exported, or um, beet that goes to animal feed, beans for animal feed, and, and things like that. So, despite being amongst the sort of a, a traditional heartland for agriculture in Britain, mm. um, very little of it is seen on the tables of the people 
around here and moving moving back to kind of to Norfolk and, and wanting to suffer market garden it, it's sort of um, uh, well we just want to supply our food to as local a community as possible yeah great so we're, we're trying to sell at the moment within a loop of neighboring villages really mm -hmm. um, which is easy on us because it makes the delivery route short and it's mm. good for the people uh, we're selling to because they're getting the food that was picked that day yeah lovely um, yeah um, cool. Okay, so that's great. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, and then I'm further away. <laughs> you're getting further away. I think that's okay. Um, I'm not sure how that sprinkler over there and the noisy birds are for the sound, but um, okay. So next question. Um, tell us a bit about your farming methods, briefly. Uh -huh. In a, one minute? Well, we grow, <laughs> we grow most of our own plants from seed, which mm -hmm. we propagate in the tunnel next door. Um, yeah. They're all, um, a lot of them started in modules, yeah. which we then plant out in various locations around the half acre that we've got here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we use no chemicals and abide by organic principles entirely. Um, Fertilising with with animal manure, um, with uh, nettle teas and, mm -hmm. and things like that, and by trying to feed our soil and maintain our soil health as as, as well as possible, allowing uh, 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 rich and um, undisturbed soil to feed our plants. Really, so we don't dig. Um, don't dig, we use a broad fork to aerate the soil, mm -hmm. um, encouraging bacteria and micro life deep, deep into the soil to kind of create a good generation, generation of nutrients up to our plants and mm. into our bellies. Great. Um, and do you have, can you just actually, why don't you just say three names of I don't know, three books or like inspirational farmers or people that people watching this might look into for, um, uh, you know. Yeah, good question. It's a good question, isn't it? Good question. I suppose three that I've been looking at lately, well, Charles Dowding. Yeah. Common household name in organic gardening and horticulture in England. Yeah. Um, based in the West Country. Great book um, that we read a lot and... He's got fantastic advice on the internet. Um, Instagram. So, you know, so fine <laughs> lines and general organic no dig techniques. And, yeah. Uh, so look at him a lot. Um, American man from Maine called Elliot Coleman, who was a kind of a real champion of small, small farming um, in America during the 20th century and into the 21st century, but mm -hmm. pioneered a lot of... Um, well, not really pioneered because he, yeah, I, I suppose um, brought to light a lot of the techniques which we're using to farm without um, out a tractor, uh, yeah. without disturbing the soil, using a lot of green manures and organic techniques. Yeah. And the third book would be... I suppose for divert... and, 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 and the sheer diversity um, a book called Miraculous Abundance which is mm. about some, uh, a couple of French farmers Charles and Perrine Hervé Gruyère <laughs> uh, farm in Normandy yeah. on a small farm uh, and just encouraging diversity in everything that they do so every, there's always it's kind of permaculture uh, yeah, extreme it's permaculture extreme exactly it, always growing into growing vegetables or animals with fruit trees yeah um, and also they're really looking forward towards um you know this uh, sort of impending doom perhaps of soil collapse and our current farming uh the current way that we farm around the world so they 
Oh, they are a bit, aren't they? They're kind of like preparing for the apocalypse and, and being able to support their local community when it comes. <laughs> Not the apocalypse, but you know. Yeah, no, um, the end of a sort of a zero carbon way of farming. Yeah. Um, and yeah, all about the sort of local approach to food growing, mm. all about diversity and what you're growing. Yeah. Create a resilient food system. An amazing sort of ecosystem for wildlife with it. Indeed. Ideally. Um, so, but not as slugs if possible. <laughs> um, so, there we, we've gone on quite a long time actually. So, I'm going to just ask you um, very quickly what are you what are you loving very quickly? You could do it like bullet points. I'm really I'm really enjoying this right now. Yeah. I'm working with my tomatoes and watching them grow. Yeah. If not, um, been enjoying the range of things that we've got out of the garden so far. Mm -hmm. already. Enjoying our, what we had our radishes and our first carrots and a lot of leafy mm -hmm. greens and spinach, mm -hmm. rocket salads and that sort of stuff. Probably most looking forward to new potatoes next week. Excellent. Um, beyond that, these guys, courgettes, rest of it. Lovely. Um, okay, and what are you? What are the major struggles so far, or things that you, maybe like you didn't anticipate that have been difficult? Things of spanners in the works. Probably losing the cover off a of polytunnel in Storm Kira. Yes, that was great. On a Sunday morning. Great. Um, okay, um, and hmm, favourite tools or like tips? Yeah. Anything that you love that makes your life really a lot? Swiss oscillating hose. Oh, Swiss oscillating hose. <laughs> I don't think we've got those at the greenhouses actually. So yeah, that's yeah. that's a good shout. Keep weaving easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yoga. <laughs> yeah, movement. I've, We're all really rusty. I'm feeling pretty achy. rusty, yes. <laughs> trying to, trying to uh, introduce a little bit of stretching into my uh, picking and harvesting routine. Yeah. And what about, actually, this is a good question. With COVID-19, how is that affecting your start up business because it actually strangely enough had um like both oh, sorry, both positive and negative effects hasn't it on starting up this kind of a business yeah it has it's um yeah we didn't expect to start a business under this sort of a, um an event but um it has it's meant i think there's been a growth in interest in local food and the local food movement and so we've mm -hmm. actually um, have, have been really lucky in the way that people have come to us, yeah, asking asking for produce. And, it's quite amazing. Um, so we've we've had to do sort of relatively little to push our veg on people. I think it's yeah. increased how receptive people are. To... Yeah, and I saw a YouGov poll that showed that um, I don't know something. There's been something like nine million um, people registering an interest in veg boxes since the crisis. So that. I mean, it's just interesting, isn't it? It's also about people not being able to go to shops and some people that you have been providing veg for are kind of isolating at home and not able to leave the house, aren't they, Tommy? Yeah. So that's cool that you can help help them. Yeah. Um, but, um, and also another bonus is that no one's been allowed to go to work <laughs> in their real jobs, paid jobs. <laughs> So yeah. there's a lot more workforce. Yeah, we've had about triple the amount of hours <laughs> on the farm that we were expecting to. So, so that's good. <laughs> managed to move some things forward. Yeah. Brings financial pressures, but yeah. Uh, in terms of labour, it's been good. Yeah. Turn out for the business. Um, and on a nice note to finish, what's your favourite? Vegetable. Ooh, there is no favourite. Oh. All equally. Oh. <laughs> okay, lovely. Thank you very much for your time, Tommy. Um, and thank you for listening. Look for greenhouses. We're missing you. I look forward to seeing you all soon.
Bye. Okay. Um, hopefully you can all hear me fine after that, after ending the screen share. Um, yeah, I just thought that was, I will, um, I will edit the interview to take out a little bit of the, uh, just a slight bit of the, the dead air and add it to the Brockwell Park Community Greenhouse's YouTube channel and then obviously the website as well. Um, it was, I spent most of my editing time for that video uh, dealing with the unique challenge of an interview subject who gets further and further away by increments throughout the, uh, throughout the interview. Um, so hopefully the sound quality was fine and you could hear Tommy's replies uh, <clears throat> as well as he kind of got <laughs> further and further away from the microphone. Um, we are going to, uh, we're going to have a question. It is Gardner's, uh, BPCG Gardner's question time after all. Uh, so we are going to, um, I only actually have, I believe, one question for, uh, for the week, but I do have some photos to show as well. Um, moment. So Janine has got uh, <clears throat> a question about her tomato plants. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share my screen again because I'm going to show the uh, works, hopefully. some yellowed leaves. Um, I'm just going to flick through these all of these photos that I have. Uh, yellow leaves are kind of the ubiquitous sign for plants to say, help, I am under stress. Um, so they can have a variety of causes. Um, I'm going to stop the sharing just a moment while I can, because I can dip back into uh, some of the advice that other members of BPCG have already given. Um, uh, Kat says, um, <clears throat> It looks as if the older leaves of the tomato plant are going yellow. Um, this will, you know, this happens as, as older leaves near the base of the plants gradually die back. You know, the leaves are produced at the, the tips. Um, so Kat just suggests kind of feeding the, the plant weekly um, as to ensure kind of healthy growth, growth higher up the plant. Um, my suggestion is always if, whenever a plant has got yellow leaves, if, if Overwatering is, in my experience, such a significant, uh, or rather such a frequent um, issue. Um, hold on, I can, I'm just going to unmute some members of the panel as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, overwatering is such a frequent issue, it's so easy to do. Um, and so it's definitely worth checking to make sure that the plant is not being overwatered. Um, the, the most straightforward way of doing that is to just, I mean, hopefully if you have access to the lower part of whatever the growing material uh, medium is, so if you've got holes in the bottom of your plant, um, if it's in a plastic pot, for example, it's to just double check that soil at the bottom. And if it is, you know, really soggy, then it's very possible that you are overwatering the plant or have overwatered the plant. Um, overwatering essentially causes the roots to first asphyxiate and then also to begin rotting. Um, neither of which is great for the plant, obviously. Um, it's just because the roots still have to breathe, they still have to respire in the same way that you and I do. Um, and if the growing medium is completely saturated with water, uh, that makes the kind of the gas exchange necessary in the same way that you and I can't breathe underwater. Um, it makes the, the, yeah, the gas exchange necessary for the roots to develop healthily. It just makes it impossible. So the roots start to asphyxiate. Um, the best thing you can do if you discover that you have overwatered the plant, i.e. check that growing medium at the bottom and it is pretty soggy. And I would recommend checking at the bottom as well if you can get there, because um, especially if you're watering indoors, um, the, the top layer of soils can get very hard. Um, and it can feel like that, you know, that, that top layer of soil is as thirsty as anything, whereas actually the layers are still kind of waterlogged. Um, move it out of the sun. Um, and give it some time to recover, just allow that soil to dry out um, is, is a very straightforward way of dealing with that. But I would double check that because I just, a lot of the time when people say, oh, I've got yellow leaves and we go through a variety of cases and it's probably overwatering just because you look at a plant starting to look a little bit stressed and it's natural to think that plant is thirsty, especially when you've, um, uh, especially when we've had a, a very dry spring, like, um, and sort of, 
regular levels of irrigation, especially if you're outside, um, can't be counted as. Um, that is <clears throat> the only question that we've got. Um, if anyone else would like to weigh in with a little bit of advice on it, then that would be great. And if not, uh, I wonder if anyone on the panel, if David, if you just have any questions for Fabrice about what we were talking about before, and especially off the back of watching Tommy's interview, um, about a potentially transformative time, let's say, uh, in sort of grassroots horticulture and local, local food growing. Or not. Uh, fine. Uh, then Fabrice, you're stuck with my question. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was just, yeah, I was just wondering if you had sort of any opinion on the, um, on the video that we just, that we just watched and what, uh, if you have any advice, someone that is watching that and thinks, that's what I want to do or that's what I feel like I can contribute. Um, should they show up? I mean, obviously volunteer organisations volunteering uh, during this period is complicated by the government guidelines of social distancing, but would you have any advice for someone that wants to start or join a project like that, um, especially so, in an urban environment? So the, one we're doing, the one we're doing at Mount Seals? Yes, yes. Okay, because at Mount Seals, the one at Mount Seals now, it's complicated by COVID because we're a small site. And some of the people who are volunteering there really are quite vulnerable in terms of their health. So we can't have people, we're not, at the moment we've shut off on it, most of the volunteering down. However, uh, if anybody at Mount Brockwell Park is interested in what we're doing and wants to talk to me about it in greater depth, so what we sow when, you know, module sizes, compost, you know, everything about planning and getting it together. Uh, I'm quite happy to talk about that. It's basically, you know, a bit like what you saw in the video, the way they're producing seedlings of the same size for the same kind of idea. So we're trying to do that, but make make like a kind of market garden greenhouse available to the whole community is what we're trying to do. So if anybody's interested in that, like maybe developing a mini a mini one at my, you know, or you know, comparing how you do yours rather with the one the one that we do at my Brock Mart Seal, I'd be really happy to talk about that. So you're probably doing the same thing anyway, just like with a slightly different emphasis. Uh, I'm glad to swap notes and see what you're doing and sort of speak to you about what I'm doing, uh, or what other people are now doing because I'm not doing it. The, you know, um, yeah, that's one thing. Uh, I think about the tomatoes is they did look like they were in very small pots. I don't know what kinds of tomatoes they are, but if they're larger tomatoes, yeah, that thing about waterlogging seems really, really pertinent. But maybe put them into a bigger pot to into fresh compost and maybe take some of the old stuff off. Because when compost gets sluggy and wet, the, comp the chemistry goes a bit weird. It's not just the plant roots that we create. Weird chemical, chemical things are happening to the soil, so it might be worth you know, repotting. And the bigger pot, really good drainage, and just hoping for the best. If the plants have got really, really stressed, and things. It might be worth taking off some of the first fruits so that the plant can do some more leaf growing, put some more energy into leaf, you know, not, not concentrating all its energy into a few fruits that have got very many leaves to change the balance around a bit. So, you know, thin the trust. As, yeah, as, so, as I thought. Cool. Yeah, so repotting there, I think, is a great idea because it gives you an opportunity to do a bit of diagnostic stuff as well, right? Like you're giving them. Yeah. You're refreshing the resources for the plant, but you can also have a look and see what the roots the root ball is doing. And if it's in an unhealthy way, at least you've you know clarified that, and you can um, yeah. Yeah, repot it, you know, and really look to drainage, and you know where to put it and stuff after that. So yeah, I think really good advice. If the roots are really hammered, you could also just put plants a bit deeper in the pot because it will make a new roots from the stem anyway. So if you're worried about some root disease or something else, planting it deeper might you know, give it a hand. Okay, excellent. excellent. Uh, so we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, I guess, I guess Fabrice, do you have any idea when you are going to be able to open up? Do you have to kind of post lockdown, kind of get the ball rolling strategy again, or is that something that's not been decided yet? I'm not the person who makes those decisions, but for the time being, we're not doing it. So I don't think we can do it for another month at least. Uh, I just think it's really, I think breaking lockdown at the moment is really premature. There's 8,000 new cases a day in the UK. It could flare up really, really fast. 
and bookers were working in a greenhouse and it could be lots of our project basically tends to work with older people most of our volunteers are like 50s and 60s so uh yeah maybe uh but i won't be making that we'll make that like, maybe later in the later in the season sure a similar situation for us at bpcg um right so i'm going to start drawing this episode to a close um yes, sure. and- Josh, Josh, if I may, uh, is, um, is Amy still with us? I can't see everybody. Is Amy still here? Uh, she's, still in the, uh, she's still in the hangout, yeah. Okay. Can, can I ask, Amy, um, have you ever um, been a volunteer? I know that you're on the volunteer list. Have, have you ever volunteered at the Greenhouse? I have, yes, yes. I, okay. I came... Okay. Um, I'll tell you I... the reason for asking. Oh, okay. We're about to write to volunteers who have registered since the 1st of March uh, because we've not had a chance to see those people. We've basically, when they've registered, they said, we've, we've sent them a letter saying, great, that you've registered, but you know, we're not open for volunteering right now. Um, so I can see that you registered about a week before then. So, so I was just checking my, my dates here are correct. I, I think 1st of March is probably the right date to go from. Yeah, I think I did. Uh, I did a couple of um, weekends. Yeah, I think maybe it was m- middle of February or something Brilliant. like that. So. I'm so pleased to hear it because I wouldn't have liked to have left you out. <laughs> no, thank you. It's the way that because obviously like we're shut and I really enjoyed the couple of times that I did. I wanted to sort of stay in touch as much as, much as I possibly okay. could. So, so, so the news is on volunteering that we're about to um, increase the number of volunteering slots mm-hmm. that we're oh, allowed really? from four until eight uh, per half day uh, starting this coming Thursday. But that'll be in the weekly email on Wednesday. Brilliant. That's really good to hear. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think probably just a, a, you know, in that case, a natural thing to close on. There is just the weekly reminder that there is still plenty of stuff going on at BPCG aside from uh, the increase in the volunteering. Um, if you still have, if you are still self-isolating or you have to self-isolate in future, or if you're in a risk group, all that sort of stuff, if you can't leave the house, even as we kind of start rolling volunteering back up again, uh, workshops, uh, things like this, like Gardener's Question Time, uh, you know, we have our various yoga sessions and loads of stuff that's happening via Zoom. Um, and there's also content being added to the BPC uh, CG website that's kind of to do like with our workshops, but is free to access. We've got uh, some stuff about uh, dying with Mahonia berries. Um, our fermentation expert, Yelena, has uh, uploaded a video about uh, fermented watermelon gazpacho, which is delicious. And if you can, you know, if you, if you can get hold of the ingredients, I do recommend it because it's going to be hot again this week, a little bit too muggy and humid. Um, so there's plenty of stuff going on via the website as well. It's not all uh, ticketed um, events, although please do consider joining those ticketed events if you have the time and inclination because it really does help us out uh, through a you know transitive and difficult period uh, as we are like the one we're currently living through. Uh, yeah, so I think that's everything. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, for those that watched it live, the uh, interview with, uh, with Tommy will be tidied up and uploaded to the YouTube channel and the website. Uh, so you can watch it with better sound quality than Zoom provides. Um, and yeah, that's that's everything for now. And we will see you again. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. I'll probably try to sort it out this haircut, which just absolutely won't go, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, and we will see you next Saturday. So thank you very much. And thank you for Breeze for joining us. Thank you. Right. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Bye.